Paolo Boncaro is one of the rising faces of the NBA. A 6 foot 10, 250 pound freight train with the build of a classic bully power forward, yet the fluid movement, ball handling, playmaking, and flashes of shot making of a wing or even a point forward. Given those outstanding traits and his status as the number one pick in 2022, many have anointed Paolo as the next big thing. The one bold comparison that you will see surprisingly often is that he is perhaps some sort of LeBron clone. At the same time, no matter what we may project onto Paolo, no matter his aura, he is still just 21 years old, and given that he made the All-Star team, and some are even pushing him as an All-NBA candidate as he leads Orlando toward the playoffs, we have to ask the question, how good is Paolo actually right now? I want to start by talking about Paolo's passing. That may be surprising given his athletic profile and raw scoring production, but considering his size and age, his playmaking skill is quite rare. In fact, he's only the third player ever at 6 foot 10 or taller to average 5 assists per game in their second season. Paolo runs more pick and rolls per game than any other player taller than 6 foot 8. He already operates as a primary creator from the perimeter, both scoring and passing. Paolo showed a lot of playmaking promise last year, but he's taken a leap this season and is averaging a very impressive 5.9 assists per game since Christmas. Like basically any offensive star, Paolo does first threaten defenses with his scoring. He's a bruising driver and a very willing jump shooter, and Orlando doesn't have the most offensive skill alongside him, ranking dead last in three-pointers made and 24th in three-point percentage. So this means teams will often load up the strong side with help on Paolo, and his ability to punish defenses with skip passes is quite impressive. With Denny trailing the screener for a second on this switch, Jones steps over to be able to tag the roller, and Paolo fires this in stride in the air, taking advantage of his size to get this over Kuz's outstretched arms to the weak side corner. Paolo probably doesn't need to pick up his dribble so quickly here, but he can only make this skip pass over two defenders who are smothering him because of his height. For most players, this possession is lost, but Paolo creates an open three. It's particularly problematic for defenses when Paolo gets a smaller player switched onto him, because you have to help, and look at him fire this cross court as he's midair. Downhill athletes like Paolo are going to collapse the defense, and he plays with a heads up drive and kick approach when he does. Watch how he engages the help defender here, then wraps around in midair to fire this to Suggs with the left, and nobody's gonna affect that shot. But it's not just simple drive and kick reads. Paolo makes some beautiful interior passes, with good anticipation to rollers or delivering a drop off once he's left his feet, and he has some nice creative moments in transition too. Paolo has these stretches where he is just dissecting defenses. This Pelicans game last week was extremely impressive. He was cleanly executing pocket passes to the roller, and his vision and patience as a passer really stand out. Look at the timing and placement of this bounce pass to a cutting Suggs. Two defenders stick with Paolo out of pick and roll here, Denny steps up thinking Wagner is still in the weak side corner, and Paolo spots him cutting baseline and fires this fastball hook pass on the money, demonstrating excellent awareness. He has an impressive sense of how he morphs defenses and the intelligence to allow things to develop. He has a clear mismatch with Sexton, and you can see he's just waiting for the double to come so he can fire this to the corner. Similarly, this is excellent processing. Steph cannot deal with Paolo on an island, so TJD comes over to double, Paolo engages him, and sneaks this lefty live dribble bounce pass into Carter in the dunker spot. This is why it's always a good idea to have a guard screen for Paolo, because if the defense switches, Paolo can bully the guard, or the screen defender hedges, and as he tries to recover to the guard, Paolo can make these passes to create open threes. But sometimes he just shows pure feel. He catches this in a tough position under the basket in a packed paint, but he's still consuming a lot of defensive attention. So he waits for Franz to drift out to the three-point line, then kicks out to him. That passing IQ with his size and willingness to try various deliveries and angles demonstrates the really impressive upside Paolo has as a passer. But he is still definitely imperfect there. Paolo can get locked on to reads, take too long to make certain decisions, and forecast them to a defense. He is staring down Gary Harris here, so it's easy for the defender to get a jump into that passing lane. He can also struggle some with accuracy. You'll notice a decent amount of those skip passes and kickouts, even when they're good reads, 
force shooters to adjust just a bit or his bounce passes are a tad low and he sometimes gets caught in the air without a plan. Because of this and an imperfect handle, his turnovers are a bit high as he averages 3.1 per game. And sometimes he just misses a playmaking opportunity to force a tough shot. He could deliver a quick pocket pass to Carter here or turn back around and throw it up to him for a relatively easy catch and finish over Steph, but instead he takes the tough turnaround. Suggs does a great job of making himself available here, and that ball has to get out to the 40% three-point shooter at some point instead of a really tough turnaround over an even bigger player. So he's not one of the elite playmakers in the league today, but he's good, and he has the potential to be a genuinely rare passing forward, and a 6'10 lead playmaker is an exceptional thing. But of course, you have to threaten defenses with scoring for that passing to really matter, and Paolo does, scoring over 22 points per game. He plays with rare pace out of pick and roll for a player of his size. I love how he traps Miller on his back here, then gathers and glides to the rim. His handle also stands out at his size. It's not perfect, but a hezzy into an in and out into a cross like this is nasty at 6'10". His paint footwork is consistently impressive as a driver too. Look at him Euro right around Wiseman. And he is a physical driver who can often just overpower defenders. He also has these possessions where he plays bully ball out of the post, and his combination of power and fluidity can really shine. And that overall physicality is a big reason Paolo eats up free throws, ranking 7th in the league in attempts per game. So Paolo gets to the rim at a healthy rate, but perhaps not quite as much as you'd expect given his athletic tools. He doesn't have the quickest first step or a super quick jump, and because he doesn't have great touch around the rim, his efficiency as a finisher is slightly below average. So he's not getting the easy stuff quite as much as you'd think just looking at him, and Paolo's biggest issue at this stage in his career is his shot diet and scoring efficiency. Of the 37 qualified 20 point per game scores this season, Paolo ranks 35th in true shooting percentage. And he's a little more than 3% below league average there. Shot selection is a big component in that. You may think of Paolo as this overwhelming athlete, but he takes a lot of pull up jumpers and he struggles to make those shots. Paolo is one of 37 players to attempt six or more pull-ups per game, and he ranks 35th out of that group with an effective field goal percentage of just over 43 on those shots. What specifically kills his efficiency is his heavy reliance on the mid-range, where he really struggles. Paolo ranks 10th in mid-range attempts per game, but shoots just over 38% there, which is comfortably worse than every player taking as many mid-range shots. And he has these moments of super impressive difficult shot making at his size with good balance, but on the whole, his reliance on these shots is really holding back his efficiency as a number one option. As we discussed earlier, Paolo does have to overcome suboptimal spacing. The Knicks are playing these gaps aggressively, so instead of barreling into a packed paint, Paolo slams on the brakes and takes a tougher turnaround. So his situation is not helping him, but Paolo definitely still bears responsibility for his shot selection. This isn't pretty spacing, but Paolo goes toward the help and does not need to take this look with 15 seconds on the shot clock. With Tyus Jones all the way sunk into the free throw line here, Paolo is much better off kicking out to Suggs, but instead he takes a relatively contested mid-range jumper. Here, the defender stunts at him, and that's all it takes for Paolo to pick up his dribble and take a tough turnaround. He's such an imposing physical force that when he has a player like Brandon Miller on him, who's giving up at least 50 pounds and there's no defensive big on the floor, he should be attacking downhill. Sure, Miller's retreating, but Paolo's not a good enough mid-range shooter to justify taking this pull-up. Same goes here with a big switched onto him in a clean paint. Paolo just forces a mid-range jumper. It'd be one thing if he were good at making these shots, but he's not. Nevertheless, he sure likes taking them. Even playing out of the post, Paolo tends to pick up his dribble a little too far out and then starts to rely on his fancy footwork, and he'll often settle for a tough turnaround, which hurts his efficiency there too. Now, none of this is a death knell for Paolo. It's not uncommon for young standout athletes to settle too much for pull-up jumpers, often particularly inefficient ones for mid-range. Anthony Edwards currently has a similar issue as one of the worst volume pull-up shooters in the league alongside Paolo. It was a different league, but LeBron took over seven mid-range field goals per game over his first two seasons and made under 35% of them. 
So Paolo absolutely has the potential to become less dependent on these shots and make them more consistently. And I expect him to prove in both of those ways. In long term, it's extremely valuable to be a good, versatile, skilled shot maker. But when we talk about his effectiveness right now, this matters a lot. Because generally, when he takes these shots, he's letting the defense off the hook. And I do want to see Paolo actively hunt the easy stuff a little more. He's an imposing athlete in the open floor, but Orlando plays at one of the slowest paces in the league, so he doesn't get as many chances to attack in transition as he could. I also think, especially if he gets paired with a high-end guard down the line, there's more potential for Paolo to do more big man stuff on offense. There was a stretch of this game against Detroit where they were using him as a screener and hunting switches, and he was punishing smaller defenders out of the post. And I think he could be utilized as a screener more overall. He can blend the primary ball handler and big man skill sets a little more instead of just trying to be a pure wing. So I see a lot of untapped potential with Paolo, but for now, because of this scoring and efficiency, he'll probably be the weakest offensive number one in the actual playoffs, but that's totally fine for a year two player. That's part of what's complicated about Paolo discourse right now. Because the Magic are quite good and he's the face of their team, people want to elevate him to the level of some of these more mature number ones, and he's not supposed to be there yet. The Magic are a very good team because they're an elite defense, second in the league in defensive rating, whereas they've struggled all year offensively, ranking 23rd. And Paolo is fine defensively. He doesn't play with super consistent effort, and he can get caught flat-footed. He has pretty average lateral quickness, so he can get beaten off the bounce. And he doesn't play with the instincts or effort to be a super impactful low man, but he's fine there. No matter where exactly you fall on Paolo's defense, though, there's no question he is far from a driving force for their success on that end. They've put together a crew of world beaters there. Isaac and Suggs are legitimate game breakers with a very strong defensive crew alongside them. So Paolo may be the face of the team, but he's not an important factor on the side of the ball where they actually excel, their defense, which is the reason they're a good team. The Magic have actually been significantly more efficient both offensively and defensively with Paolo off the floor this year and of course that doesn't mean he's actually been a negative but is it true that a low efficiency mediocre defender in his second year whose team has a significantly better point differential with him off the floor maybe hasn't yet ascended to the level of the more polished veteran stars some already want to compare him to Yes, that's true. If I were to do player rankings, Paolo is somewhere in the 30s right now. A great spot to be in year two with the potential to be a top 10 sort of player down the line. I'm not trying to rag on Paolo at all because I think he is on an excellent trajectory, but we have a tendency to conflate aura and potential with a player's value right now. Like I love Ant, but he isn't an MVP caliber player just yet, and a lot of people will tell you he's already Michael Jordan walking among us. Similarly, I think people see Paolo's flashes and traits and upside and want to ignore there's still an inconsistency and lack of refinement there that is inevitable in a 21-year-old. He is not an all-NBA caliber player yet. But the dude is a stud oozing with potential, and I'm incredibly excited to see what he can do in his first crack at the playoffs this year. It's gonna be fun.